is 25, right? Is it 20? Don't turn it. Thank you, Africana. Today, today I thought I would talk about something that I often talk about, and I think I've talked about before in in regards to second life specifically. So it might be something, some of it you might have heard before, but I want to go fairly general. It's just the concept of reality. Of course, apropos the virtual reality environment. And Buddhism as well, it's one of the four concepts in Buddhism. In, in uh, Buddhism, we often use the word satcha. We talk about levels of truth. Satcha means truth. And in Sanskrit, satya. So there's ultimate truth and there's conventional truth. And then we use the word dhamma or dharma, which mean which can be translated as reality. It's not what the word originally meant, but came to mean that in Buddhist discourse. Because dharma mean comes from dhar, the word dhar, which means to carry, or in regards to carrying, holding. So it originally, I, I mean, I don't know when it originally, but it, it became very well known to refer to what someone holds to be true. Like just as we hold objects, we also hold views. So whatever views a person held, who is a, re a religious teacher, you might start to think, wait a minute, that would be their dharma. Or um, if a group of people like the the nobles or the Brahmin, Brahmins, if they held a certain set of doctrines and that was their dharma, or the, if they had a code that they upheld, dharmas that they upheld, that's where it became famous as a word. And I don't really know the, the history of it, but at least in Buddhist discourse it became that which holds its own reality. And it seems to me, I, I don't, again, I'm, I'm not, not a scholar in this regard, but it seems to me that it, it, um, it, it made a progression there because, you know, the Buddha's dharma, the Buddha's, what the Buddha held to be true, uh, was that what was that which held to be true in ultimate reality, meaning it holds true up, it holds up through in, uh, inspection and it holds true under inspection. So we use the word dharma. Dharma is a good word for reality. If we're talking about reality, dharma is one meaning. And the word reality itself is slippery, a little bit slippery. I mean, a lot of people, when they think of ultimate reality, and a lot of Buddhists, there are Buddhist schools, major Buddhist schools out there who hold reality to be something other than mundane experience. So reality is, is 
it's somehow esoteric or um, as it were moved from the mundane. So what I'm going to do, I, I'm, I'm approaching this from my point of view of my experience, this is the Colorado story. And I'm just going to go through some of the ways that we look, we might look at reality, or the way people might look at reality. So the first uh, reality of interest to us today is virtual reality to us. Virtual reality, virtual reality is an interesting concept because the word virtual um, gives the, the idea of it being almost real that somehow we've begun to approach real, which I don't think really is how we view virtual reality. It's m virtual reality is, is, is still fake. It's not real. It's not like there is something of the given shape in front of you, right? Because when you see a shape, you, you, you have the impression there's a shape there. Now in, in quote unquote reality, uh, there actually is a shape there that you can touch, you can investigate, you can experiment upon to find the properties of. But virtual reality doesn't 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 approach that in any way. It gives a impression of something that is totally fake. You know, like all this shadowing and and lighting and coloring, every, everything is just an illusion, completely. You know, the screen in front of you doesn't have contours and and so on. All it has is color and light and various degrees of color and light. So it's not even coming all that close to reality. And, you know, you could even uh, suppose there was, let's say, a holodeck, for example, like this Star, Star Trek thing. Even a holodeck is... Um, it's fake, right? It's not coming close to real. Even if you have something that feels and smells and tastes even like reality, well, it would be interesting if it actually began. Anyway, the point being, if you saw a person on the holodeck, it would still not be a person. It wouldn't be almost a person. It would be completely an illusion of a person. And science fiction fiction likes to test this, the, the boundaries here. Um, if you if anyone is con familiar to the Turing test, I'm dealing with AI. But the, the idea behind the Turing test is that if you can't tell the difference, then there is no difference, which isn't really the way we look at reality, in, at least in, from a Buddhist point of view. There actually has to be something real there. So that's um, I mean that's of interest to us, practically speaking, because uh, second, th things like virtual reality can be highly intoxicating because they are not real. We can control them uh, to an extent. Artificial intelligence is controllable. I don't think Stefan Marsh has all that much artificial intelligence, but artificial reality, you know, you can we can sit here in the forest and if we don't want mosquitoes here, we obviously don't implement a artificial mosquito. You know, if we don't want to we don't want it to rain on us, so we don't let it rain. So we can control and we can keep things calm and peaceful. We don't have a factory nearby polluting our environment. We don't have we don't have reality factors encroaching on our enjoyment. You know, we're able to. We, I mean, the great thing, or not great thing, the great attraction to something like this is its unreality because in reality you have to face certain truths and so there's a danger of virtual reality that it 
it spoils the, the reality. And then when you're faced with the cold, hard truth of reality, well, I mean, some people would argue that it's an a way of escaping, you know, taking a vacation from reality, which is understandable. But we would probably argue that it's it's intoxicating and it, it makes you less able to actually deal with reality. I mean, I'm not, uh, this is just one way of looking at things. There's actually, an, I'll get to it, there's a more interesting way of looking at things that is actually more favorable to Second Life, and I'm actually fairly favorable about this platform, in my opinion. But there is absolutely that aspect of getting spoiled by virtual reality, because it's not really real. And it's intoxicating, you know, it, it makes you, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's about seeking pleasure and beautiful sights and enticing experiences and so on. On the other hand, still talking about this sort of difference between virtual and alternate reality is you get to escape some of the barriers and obstacles to communication. For example, the obstacle of space. You know, I mean, we can't sit together in a room, all of us, obviously. Not in real life, but in Second Life, we can sit together in a room together. Um, you know, we, d we don't bring the baggage to the table. We can appear as we see ourselves. I mean, I guess an interesting one would be people uh, who are transgender can come on here and be the person who they think they are. I mean, this is more of a worldly, not, uh, not exactly something that they're really all that concerned about, but but this general idea of being able to transcend obstacles is, I think, of interest to spiritual people as well. Um, to be able, to if you if you live in a city, to to just be able to come here in the forest, it gives you this, the illusion of it gives you this sense of peace that can put you in the mood to meditate, right? I mean, just sitting here together, we kind of feel like, oh, well, meditation puts you in a meditative m mode, mood. And I think that's important, even for Buddhism. Sometimes illusion or appearance is important. Uh, on a conceptual level, when you come and sit in the forest, you think about meditation. And, and more importantly, when you get to see people meditating, like if you look around at all these people sitting respectfully, I bet if we saw each other sitting in front of our computers, we'd probably be a little bit less impressed. Some people are probably playing with their sports or some people are probably fidgeting. Some people are probably listening to music or talking to other their friends or picking their noses or all kinds of things, right? So, so seeing this is, uh, I I it's, a, it's an illusion of all of us sitting very still, but that appearance ha has an effect on our psyche. So illusions can be useful. I mean, we've even got stories of how the Buddha used illusions. He used uh, images of himself to give people a sense of peace. He um, he played with appearances. I mean, some, uh, some of the stories are just folk stories. We don't know whether they actually happened or not from the commentaries, but um, there is a sense that illusion can be beneficial, or appearances as well just in general appearances can be useful. So that's one interesting aspect of reality. I mean, it's just to help us think about our experience. And Buddhism is all about understanding. So exploring these concepts, I think, is useful for all of us. Put us in the right frame of mind and really understand what are we doing here? What's happening to us now? So the the second type of reality is is the opposite is is ultimate um, is what do we call it what would you call it the opposite of virtual reality we would just call it reality I guess like when someone tells you to get real or in real life right we talk about in second life we always use the, the term real life in fact people say it as well or as when someone lives in a fantasy they say you know well well real life isn't like that or the real world isn't like that. You're living in a dream world, right? 
So the opposite is reality. It's just reality is your understanding for now. But the reality is probably you're sitting in a room alone, staring at a piece of plastic with light coming out of it with some plastic stuff on your head pumping sound into your ears pumping waves of particles into your eardrums that are then vibrating and all this visual and audio sens uh, stimulation is then traveling through while it's, it's triggering an, uh, neuron chains of neurons in your brain and there's all sorts of areas but specific areas that process the information and come up with an idea of what it is that you're experiencing sometimes the, ear the idea is based on quote unquote reality sometimes it's based on illusion like in this instance we have the illusion of seeing lots and uh, there's a whole bunch of people sitting in a park together and then if you shift, suddenly you realize it's just a flat screen. And you remember, oh, I'm sitting here. And you realize, yes, I, I feel myself sitting in this chair. I feel these headphones on my ear. You suddenly hear the noises in the room around you. It's like that. So the reality aspect of things is it's important and it's it's what people will tell you is important, especially those of us who do things like second life. I bet some monks, if they saw me, they would shake their heads and say, what are you doing in that? What are you doing staring at that piece of plastic and thinking that it's somehow you sitting in a room with a bunch of people? People like to, you know, kids who play video games or people who watch television or, or, or are caught up in fantasies, even people who read, read lots, of no, uh, lots of fiction, people will tell them to get real, right? to uh, not be part of the real world, to get caught up in fantasy. But it's important. To, it is true to get caught up in fantasy. I mean, fantasy is 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 wonderful fantasy is probably better than reality in all ways except one i mean you can you can fix anything in fantasy it's better it, it, it has the potential to be better in every way if there's something wrong with reality create a fantasy that is that that doesn't have that that flaw that fault so in all ways but one it's superior of course that one way is that it's not real and no matter how much fantasy you engage in, you can't escape reality. And that's a key distinction. Second life, you can turn on and off. First life, you can't turn off. If you kill yourself, guess what? It doesn't turn off. It doesn't go away. And that makes it very important. It means if we don't pay attention to that fact, we set ourselves up for 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 problems here. When if if we're not paying attention to reality, we're not really learning how to live in reality, not cultivating the developing the skills needed just to live our lives. Then um, when trouble does come in reality, we can't just turn back. If someone's bullying you on the internet, you know you can just turn off the internet. You can't do that in real life. So sometimes we use fantasy to run away again and, and, and this is dangerous. It's important that if we're going to use things like skills like second life, it's important that we be clear that we're using them for purposes that actually aid us in first life because um, they have to be different. So this is still all conventional. And this is what we would call conventional truth or conventional reality. Because in ultimate reality, there's a curious fact that whether we are seeing the room around us or whether we're seeing people sitting in a park, it actually isn't 
categorically different one from the other. Right? Because the keyboard on the desk in front of me is still just light touching my arm. Or you could even go further and say it's just an experience uh, in the mind, experience of seeing. So that's lots of experiences. First of seeing, then of recognizing, then of processing, and then maybe some judging of good or bad. Many, many experiences that combine together to make up seeing a keyboard. And that's not categorically different from me seeing this baby deer sitting beside me in the in, s in the deer park. Except there will be some different experiences like potentially the realization that it's not real. You know, there will be some qualitative differences. That's really it. So from a, a point of view of ultimate reality, seeing virtual, rea virtual reality and, and ultimate reality, the only difference is pixel quality. Pixel quality is better. Um, graphics quality. Real life has better graphics. Not necessarily better shapes and objects, but better graphics. And this is this is crucial. This idea is crucial to understanding ultimate reality from the point of view of Theravada tradition, the tradition that I study. And of course, there are other definitions of ultimate reality, but for us, ultimate reality is equal or is um, equivalent to uh, mundane reality. So what we experience on a mundane level, that is ultimate reality. It's not something mysterious or deep, sublime, or global. It's actually quite mundane. And we all experience ultimate reality on a regular basis. That's what makes it ultimate. It's in an ultimate sense what we are really experiencing. So the the key in Buddha or the important practice in Buddhism is not to experience ultimate reality, but to to dwell and to be focused on ultimate reality solely. To the extent that we're able to see the difference between ultimate reality and conventional reality. So in meditation practice, through cumulative practice, we get to the point where our experiences, our um, awareness, our focal, focal point is solely on ultimate reality and we lose, we lose the conventional reality. You know, it all sounds very high, you know, these terms sound probably kind of uh, uh, lofty and, and vague, but they shouldn't be because really we're talking about very simple things. The difference between an object and the experience of the object. So when you experience the words that I'm saying, those words are just content. The ultimate reality is nothing more than sound. And so if you start to pay attention really to what I'm saying, you'll see that the experiences are not the same as that person is talking. The experiences are, there is the sound, the experience of the sound, and there's a processing, and there's actually remembering. When I stop talking, you can repeat in your mind, the th with the same intonation, with the same voice, not even your voice, you can use my voice in your mind, you can play back my voice. The moment after I say it, you can hear what I just said again. So 
this is the ultimate reality. This is what's really happening through moments of experience and of mental uh, experience, um, mental reflection of past experience, which is an experience in itself. And this is this distinction is essential to Buddhism, being able to make this distinct distinction, because conventional reality, whether it be in second life or in, in, in real life, is still not able to, or still not properly called reality, still does not um, carry the characteristics, hold the characteristics, have the characteristics of of, re of ultimate reality, of, of, of what is truly real. So for example, the person who I am, you know, if you think of me sitting here and you're looking at me and you're watching me teach, that person being a concept in your mind is eternal, you know, potentially, is, is something that you can Un that is unchanging. So you look at me and you and you think of me, think of this person, and then every time you think of them, they potentially are remember the same person. There is no quality to that idea that changes. And furthermore, um, therefore, can be however you want it to be. So you can have an idea of a person, someone, people, we do this all the time with people that we love, we idealize them. We think of a person, that, you know, people who we love, and we think of them as in their perfect form. When you're fresh in love, you think only, you see only the good things, your love is blind, right? Shakespeare famously said. But he wasn't, he wasn't, uh, you know, it's not a, for, for Shakespeare, I don't think it was a uh, compliment. He was pointing something out, that we idealize uh, each other. With people you don't like, on the other hand, you vilify them. We, we, we often fall into this, the, the F, the delusion the problematic understanding or idea of people as being wholly bad, wholly evil. We only think of them as evil. That person is evil. And you can do that with a person. You can do that with a concept. But you can't do that with reality. And so this is why relationships often, they often fall apart when we're shocked and disappointed when people act in a way that we can't believe they would act you know, when, when spouses or, or um, partners cheat on each other. I mean, it's reality. That's the person that they were. That's all that's, that's what happened. But we can't abide by that because we had an idea of, or a view of them and we're shocked. And moreover, we're disappointed and, and because of our expectations. And, and, and expectations are a big part of the result of holding on to conventional reality. When we can do away with our expectations, especially when we focus on, on ultimate reality, uh, we see a reality, we see, we see that things quite differently. We're able to see people changing. We're able to understand how change occurs. We lose our expectations. We come to be less disappointed or not disappointed. So ultimate reality has three characteristics that many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with. The, the characteristic of impermanence. That the reality behind people and places and things is always changing. It's uncertain. It's full of surprises. 
and so you're vulnerable if you s if you cling to conventional reality, if you cling to things, if you break away from things. Things might change. They're subject to change. In many cases, you'd rather they didn't change. Things that were against the thing brings you pleasure, that thing. If something brings you pleasure because it's X, well, then it becomes Y. This is where disappointment comes from. The second is that they're unsatisfying, or, or basically suffering. Suffering is how it's called, but what it means is not happiness. Uh, because some, some things are unpleasant directly. But all things are unsatisfying. Why? Because they change. They're subject to change. If you, if you take one thing, the most pleasant thing you can think of, no matter what it is, in ultimate reality, it can't satisfy because it's not always going to be there. It's not going to be there when you want it to be. It's not under your control. You can't make it be there whenever you want. And this is why we're dissatisfied, because we're not in control. And moreover, there's, there's laws of nature inherent in pleasurable things that say things like, the more you want something, the more you need of it to make you happy, which is an unsustainable system, because you're always going to have to be getting more and more and more. You, you can't get an infinite amount of a substance until eventually your desire leads you to disappointment. Invariably, I mean, intrinsically, the system is unsustainable because just the math of it, the logic of it, if you need more of it all the time, you either have to get an infinite amount of it, which is impossible, or at some point you're going to suffer from it. That's inevitable. There's no, there's no situation where that doesn't happen. So that's what it means by, that's re really what is meant by dukkha. Or you could just say suffering. I mean, people don't like to use that translation because pleasure is suffering. It means that pleasure has you, you know, causes you suffering. Has the potential to cause you suffering. Not by itself, but if you cling to it. And so the idea behind all three of these char char characteristics is is to, to let go of them. I mean, the, there's no problem with things being impermanent. There's no problem with things being dukkha. There's no problem with things being, the third one, anatta, a non-self, unless you cling to them. And unless you expect them to be otherwise, to be stable, satisfying, pleasurable, self. And so the third characteristic, non-self, uh, is, is this concept of things being unamenable to one's control, and don't be not belonging to anyone, and further, not having any substance in and of themselves. So not something you can hold on to, not something you can depend upon. upon because they're impermanent and don't cause suffering. They're not something you should want to possess or cling or feed on. But um, even more interesting, they being beings, let's say everything we experience, are not under our control. We can't turn on or off our emotions. We can't choose our experiences. What we can do is make choices about our experiences. And the interesting con the interesting concept of, of free will, determinism, and so on, is that it appears that we can make choices. At every moment, there is an ab ability to make a choice. There is a choice being made at every moment. It's a very small choice. And there's lots of options, at least one but it's in how we react to things. And those reactions do change the future. If you react violently to something, well, you get a violent result. And if you do it frequently enough, it becomes habitual, and your surroundings change, 
Kristen telah berapa tahun tinggal di Indonesia dan di lokasi lain di sudah hampir 30 tahun untuk bersama Allah. To make sure of that and to have frequent enough torments and make sure of that and to make sure of that. And so this is the practice of meditation. This is this is the focus of of our meditation in our tradition. Focusing on these habits, learning about our habits, cultivating wholesome and ultimately liberating habits. So meditation is just the building of a habit. If you meditate moment after moment, it becomes habitual. And eventually all the few things fade away and become old. Once you get to the point where you're able to see things clearly on a, on a regular enough basis, like moment after moment after moment, your mind shifts because it's only clinging moment after moment that keeps us tied to samsara. When you start letting go enough, you know, enough moments in a row, it gains this momentum and, and, and frees you from that that trap that we've got ourselves stuck in, stuck in. When you slip free, you enter into what we call Nibbana. Now, Nibbana is, is probably the last, it's its own category of reality. I mean, we don't normally talk about it as being an, uh, its own category, but I think we should recognize that it's categorically different. So another distinction between realities, and if I may, I may just wrap up here and, you know, ask questions as well, you know, is um, samsaric reality, the reality of samsara, and the reality of nibbana, which is the or nirvana, which is the two very different things. Samsara is this arising, this this constant, incessant experience. Nibbana is a state or a reality. It's a dharma where there is no arising. That's why. So it's permanent. It's eternal because. It's only things that arise that end up ceasing. So if there's no arising, then there's no ceasing. So there's no birth and there's no death. There's no coming and no going. But that, some people will say Nibbana, Nirvana is the only ultimate reality. We don't normally say that. But it does have a different kind of reality to it. It's perfectly peaceful. It's peaceful in a way that even unconsciousness isn't or sleep isn't. It's uh, infinitely profound because there is no there is no limit to it. Right? There is nothing there is nothing uh, weakening it. It's it's a completely it's a complete thing, something that is absolute. Absolute cessation. So it's quite, quite the experience. It's uh, the goal of Buddhist practice in my tradition, anyway. I think in most traditions, ultimately, nirvana is the goal. And so it's considered to be, the in in one sense, the highest form of reality. So there you are. That's a survey of reality, if you will many aspects and just food for thought for all of you sort of an under to, to gain a framework of understanding helping us to look at these things in the right way and hopefully facilitating proper proper practice so that we don't get caught up too much in convention and all that but it's an important subject for buddhism so i thought it would be something that i find interesting after all that's all i have to say for today wishing you all the best if you have questions, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, I'll have a good day. I'm not allowed to talk about my own experiences. Anything else?
Yeah, go ahead and talk. I just put my headphones on so I can hear you. But you really need headphones yourself, otherwise you're going to echo me. I can, but I'm echoing in your speakers, I think. I don't know. Nope, still echoing. I mean, the idea of noting I in our tradition is to, okay, look, you have to turn off whoever's echoing. You've got to turn off your speakers. So it's not me. Who's echoing me? Or is that me? No. I'm sorry, I'm echoing myself. <laughs> so <laughs> I apologize. I'm accusing you. Um, yeah, so you ain't got them. Um, the idea of noting is to s prevent the reaction to the experience. So absolutely, after you experience thinking, you're just reminding yourself that was thinking. It's fine to say to yourself, thinking, thinking. If you don't feel comfortable, another way of doing it is saying knowing, knowing, knowing that you were thinking. So the, the noting is just a way of looping back to the experience so that we don't react to it. Question? I can't talk about my experiences because I'm a Buddhist monk. Um, it, it has to do with the problems surrounding bragging about your experiences and the potential for abuse. Also, it puts undue potentially undo uh, undo attention on the, the individual such that people will pay attention to that individual you know it creates uh, different problems people will dis will will doubt you and will focus and they'll focus too much on talking about which monk is in is has this power and which monk has that power so It's just because I'm a monk. It's not a Buddhist concept, really. Uh, but that being said, it's it's sort of understood that people don't talk about their personal experiences because it's kind of you know bragging about oneself. Or there's a sense that enlightened beings would tend to shy away from this, except for the Buddha, who was you know certainly not shy about his own opinions. But we don't want to put undue attention onto ourselves because it can get out of control and people say, 
uh, people start to think that that person is infallible. Only the Buddha, the Buddha was understood to be infallible, but people start to overestimate their teachers based on the teacher's claims, even if they're true. Like, if a teacher says that they can read people's minds, then people start to put undue um, importance on that. You know, reading people's minds doesn't mean you're enlightened, for example. Or if a person says that they have seen Nibbana, well, that doesn't make them fully enlightened. It's not just seeing it once. You have to free yourselves from all, yourself from all defilement. So if someone's seen it once, we call them a sotapanna, if you know that term. But even then, they can they can fail in, in, in many ways, and so it leads to overestimate. So this is too much. The focus is not on the person. The focus is on one's own practice and one's own account. point is it's not important what they've seen. The importance is what the results are of the things that they teach. So it's the teachings that are of most importance. If you focus on what other people have experienced, then you're, you're focusing on something that you can't verify. So I guess a w another way of answering is you don't know even if they do tell you, because they might be lying to you, or they might be overestimating themselves. Furthermore, what they're talking about is incomprehensible if you haven't experienced it yourself. So it's not a really good focus. It's not really important. What's important is whether the teachings lead to the ultimate result. That being said, you do want to have a sense that a person is trustworthy, but you do that not by what they're saying, but you do that by watching them closely and staying with them for some time. start to get a sense of who they are and that's real in a way that their words are not even if someone says they're enlightened it's just words it doesn't affect you in the same way as watching them and saying wow this person is really cool or this person is not cool Another thing that happens, and, and this really does happen, is people, because, I mean, uh, just thinking about why monks are not allowed to, is that people will focus on those monks. If everyone said you know, exactly where they were at and told all sorts of lay people, then it would only be the monks who had gained, uh, g gained attainment who would be supported. And that happens, you know. I, in my monastery, lots of monks, monks who were even practicing quite well, but nobody wanted, nobody cared about them, and, and they were they were very poorly taken care of as far as just having enough food to eat and that kind of thing, having soap to do to wash their clothes or wash their bodies, that kind of thing, just basic necessities. Uh, and the you know the head monks and and the high up monks were very well off, and these people were only focusing on them, and so that happens. That's just another reason for not not disclosing these things to lay people, not wanting to, to support the organization so that people who aren't, uh, you know, it has to do with relations with lay people. That is a big part of why monks aren't allowed to. Because then you see what happens is then monks say, hey, the only way I can get respect is if I start lying about my attainment or that kind of thing. So you stay away from any self-defining. I mean, not not really. We don't try to stay away from things. We try to learn about them. So if you have a self-defining, you want to learn about that and why you have a self, why you define yourself. How you define yourself. 
you know, to see what is the result of having a self and so on. And the point is to eventually see that things like clinging to self are perceiving yourself that they're problematic. They cause stress and suffering and so on. Conflict complication. statements are not really a problem. So we stay away from, I mean, just, just by the nature of knowing the problem with them, you know, having seen through them, we stay away from the conceiving of I. But conventionally, we have to talk about I and me and so on. So we don't explicitly stay away from the statements, except in places where it where it de where it confu it's confusing. So, for example, saying, "I am an angry person," is is in general a fairly problematic statement because it it's confusing the issue. But it's nothing to do with the fact of using the word "I" or "I even I am." It's about creating the idea of a person. That's what it is. Statements like "I don't deserve that" are highly confusing. But if you say, I am here, you know, I am a Buddhist monk, it's not, the c it's not the statement that's the problem. It's if you identify internally with being, say, a Buddhist monk, then that can be problematic. But it's the, it's the mind. Statements are just statements. As long as they're accurate, even in a conventional way, they're not a problem. You can say I am angry. It's not really a problem. It, it it's it has a bit of a danger to it because it can potentially lead you to think of it as being intrinsic to you. It's better, of course, to see the anger just as anger. But even the Buddha said when you should note to yourself, "Gachami, I am walking." So I mean, it's not the statement. It's the the mind state behind it. Right. Right. So in Mahayana, they have a different concept of ultimate and conventional truth. I'm still trying to get my head around the way they look at it, but it's more. Uh, it's a little bit confusing for me to try to put it from a Theravada point of view. I mean, the Tiantai uh, doctrine, which I'm just learning about now, um, took the earlier Buddhism concept of um, conventional reality and ultimate reality and then added a third was the compatibility of the two. So this three truths. And that was highly influential, in, I think, in Mahayana Buddhism. I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't have much to say about the Mahayana. It's just not my school. I'm not 
well versed in it. Uh, quite focused on knowing still. So I've given what I've given you is a kind of a rather view of things, and probably some of it is just my own understanding. Unless there are other questions immediately, I'm going to say goodbye to everyone. Wish you all a good day. Thank you all for coming out.